Welcome to Headlines. This is David Lichtenstein, Yeshiva Shalmaila. I think we may be the biggest share in the world. We're getting around, give or take, 15 to 25,000 listeners a week. So there's a good share, and somebody in your shul is also listening, and maybe you can discuss it. Maybe you can get into an argument, a discussion. What's the very Torah? It's all about... Chadidim says Bahalacha, Tamid Hachamim the Gemara says, shop at each other by arguing with each other. I had a somebody I met, I told him recently, I said I never went to college. He said, Ha so Fry uh, uh, actually an Italian fellow, he said, The best college in the world, he said, is going to Yeshiva to teach you how to think. This is from an Italian banker. So this week we're gonna have a very interesting discussion. Genetic testing in Halacha. How much information is too much information? You know, I was sitting around the Shabbos table and I asked somebody, would you like to know, going into a shidduch, any possibility, a reasonable possibility that your spouse could have a disease? A lot of people said yes. I said, well, how about, would you like to know, if they, what type of living they would earn, what their temper would be like, we could tell genetically, would, what, what their life would be like, how many kids you would have. Um, many of the other things that we could say would boil down to some type of a physical, a gene, or some type of a chemical, etc. What was their their moods going to be like in the future? Then I said, well, what would you like? Would you like to know the day you would die? That's it. I have exactly till to fill in the date. Like, at how much point do we say, I'm sorry, this is just too much information? So we're going to be speaking about genetics and halacha. We will have Hagoyin or Herschel Shech, the Rashi Rabbi He's the the the, 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 the OU's Paisik, speaking about. We're going to speak about. Well, today they have J Screen. It tests for 220 diseases. He's going to say you're going to hear Rabbi Herschel says, of course, if you could know and you could through PGD avoid the transfer, the uh, passing on generation to generation of diseases. What could be better? Now we're going to hear. The uh, the Rav of Chicago, the Dayan of Shmuel first, he's going to permit Musbach by Ramayisha. He's going to say, no, 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 way too much information. Shidduchim won't happen if you know every other possibility. That's it. You talk about a Shidduch crisis now, that would cause a Shidduch crisis. And what about a little bit of a Moon and Betachin? We will speak from somebody, uh, Nehemia Kraus, the father of two children with muscular dystrophy, will speak about how he wishes he did, but we will hear from two doctors who are leading ethicists on this, Dr. Daniel Eisenberg, professor of medicine at the Jefferson Medical School, lecturer of Fuhr and Halacha, and Rabbi Gidden Weitzman from Archistrol, the director of Pua Institute for Fertility. We will have a debate on this topic. I'm curious, what is your opinion? Now, of course, we get a lot of opinions. I put almost all of them up on our Mara McCoyman's page. We put our calls as well as our emails. I put almost all calls and emails as, as long as they are reasonably, reasonably polite. Those that actually border into just rude, I don't have any time for rude in my life, nor do I think that a forum where we talk about halacha and ashkafa has room for rude, and we get a lot of, you know, just a lot of rude people. I, I remember, of, oh, let me share with you a vart for a Beryl Soloveitchik on this week's Parsha. He said he heard it from somebody, a fabulous vart. He said, it says by the Arba, Moshe said, uh, Pari said, take away from me, rock as hamavis hazais. Take this death away from me. So, Somebody came into a barrel and he asked him, why is it called Hamavis Hazai? So Beryl said, no. So the fellow told her barrel, he said, because Chazal say that the Arabed didn't eat on Shabbos. They were religious. They were a, a, a vicious enemy to Pari, but they were they were a frumer enemy. So this fellow said, Hamavis Hazai, there's nothing worse than a, 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 a fruma. A fruma maka is the worst maka you could have. With frum kai we could do. So we get some really nasty goals. But everything, even the people who disagree the most, I put it on the air as long as it's done polite. I ask you to call in with your opinion. Before we go to our wonderful guests, I would like to share a vart. This week it's all about freedom. It's about cheros, Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. And what comes right after Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim? Ukshartem lois al yadecha, the mitzvahs of Tfilin, Laman tia tairas Hashem beficha, Tfilin right after Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. And the question is, why, of all the mitzvahs in the Torah, why is Tfilin coming right after Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim? So I have a question for you, my wonderful co listeners. What is freedom about? What is the, what is the Milahaner Defis that should go with Cheros? Is it Cheros from? Freedom from? Or Cheros too. 
Like, what does freedom from mean? Freedom from slavery, from oppression, from poverty, from molestation, from from over demands. Uh, just fill in from from addiction. That's freedom from. We understand that. These are all the freedoms. Or is freedom about freedom too? Freedom to what? To be over whoever you to, 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 to religious freedom. Freedom to speak, freedom to make your own laws, freedom to legislate, freedom to control your day, your destiny, your future. What is freedom? So here's something interesting. I think that in the world we see very often how the concept of freedom has gotten destroyed. It's been lost. Freedom lost. The dangers of freedom. And let me share with you a story. I know somebody. He went to dental school, and he's a brilliant guy. So he figured out that there are many places that they, it's very difficult to take the patients, let's say, to a dental, you know, a dentist. So he bought a, like some type of a truck. He put five different or four different dental chairs in it, hired four dentists, gave them each, you know, whatever a good salary for a dentist is, and would start going to uh, senior citizen centers, senior housing, nursing homes, he would line up, and people wouldn't have to go to a dentist. They would just bring out all 200 patients, and he became just filthy rich. And what did he do? What He said, I don't have to work anymore. So he bought a huge screen. I don't know how big. He could afford anything, an eight-foot screen, and he sat at home, and he watched videos for 15 hours a day. It's a true story. He could afford it. He just had popcorn and videos 15 hours a day. I ask you, is this freedom? I mean, in, in our lives, we don't watch popcorn. And, but talk about freedom. You know what freedom? Freedom to, if, if, if it's just freedom from, but there's no freedom to, well, it could be freedom, too many choices. Freedom to abuse. Freedom to divorce. Freedom to cheat on our spouse. Freedom for alcohol, for drugs, for pornography. Freedom from commitment. I mean, with technology, there's an endless amount of choices today. Endless amount of choices. Freedom to gamble all day. You don't even have to go to Vegas or Atlantic City. Today, the person could stay at home and online gamble endlessly. So freedom from is just a half answer. And you know, a half answer does nothing. Do you know that halacha, we spoke about Birch HaSagayimel last week, I'll tell you something interesting halacha in Birch HaSagayimel, Ramayisha Paskins, and most of the Achreinim agree with him, he says if you're going on a journey, and it's halfway, you go to Eretz Yisrael, he held, you do, you do make a Birch HaSagayimel on the flight, and he says you don't make the Gaimel until you come back, it's a half a journey, you're not done. Freedom from is a, half, is a half-baked answer. Where is it to? Where is your freedom taking you to? Because otherwise, you can end up, we see, Rahman al here's a statistic from the Washington Post. Your average 15, this is fresh, like current, the last, fifth, your average 15 to 18 year old spends eight hours a day, not a typo, that was eight hours a day on social media. So I'm talking about unzer and necessary, but talk about how freedom from, without a freedom to, without a mission, without something to bind you to a laser-like vision. What do I do with all that freedom? The freedom becomes self-consuming. I mean, you see people, you know, they date, and they can never get married because there's just so many dates. There are so many shadachim, so many women. Freedom becomes something destructive, too much freedom. So what does it say right after Yitzhiyah's Mitzrayim? The Torah is so weird, Kal Yisrael, that too much freedom. What do we say in Eli Tzion, and and Tisha B'av, what do we say, right? About the Al Inui B'nei Chayrin, the torture of the free. Free people could also have torture. Kal Yisrael's Batsam Ben Chayrin. It's called Cheros Eilam Yitzias Mitzrayim. But we are free people. Free people without a two ends up with all that. Abuse, divorce, cheating, alcohol, drugs, etc. So what does it say? The first thing you have to eat to Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim, tie it on to you, create a mission, 
look at that mission directly in the eye and say, I'm going to use the gift of freedom that Baruch Hashem we have here in the world today, and I'm going to use that, because without it, too much freedom is just as dangerous as no freedom at all. Let's go to our wonderful guests for the hour debate. How much information is too much information? We have the great honor of having us on the phone, Hagoyin Raparashal Shachta. He's the Rosh Hashiva of Rabbi Yitzhak Al-Khanan. He's also, uh, you know, a noted speaker, Paisik, and he's the halachic advisor for Kashris for the OU. Welcome to the Rosh Hashiva. Thank you. Let me ask the Rav. Um, we had on the here on the radio. We had two different opinions. We had very Yishim, which only tests for diseases that are caused when the husband, because the husband and wife get married together, but for diseases that are in the, and then there's a, and they test for, I don't know, 40 some odd diseases. And there's a new thing called J screen that tests for like 200 diseases, muscular Mm -hmm. dystrophy, et cetera. And, um, and they say that because of that, people who do it and find out that, you know, that they have a reasonable chance of, et cetera, of, uh, of these diseases, they would suggest to them to use PGD or some other uh, way to avoid, let's say, passing on muscular dystrophy, to have a child okay. who has muscular dystrophy. Does Rosh Hashiva have an opinion as to, now that they have these new tests, whether it is preferable to go with Dari Sharam and say on these, all these other diseases, Shem Ibsayim Hashem, or whether one should use J-Screen and with hope of maybe preventing a life of incredible hardship, both for the parents and for the child, and uh, it doesn't fit into their Shem uh, Epsayim Hashem. What's Roshiva's opinion? I would say the second way. I don't think that Shem Epsayim Hashem. That's like a guy walking, a blind person walking by the ocean is going to fall in and drown. Yeah, you can prevent it. You can test and you'll know in advance uh, to take care of this. You use the PG, whatever it is there. PGD, Chvezos. So you see to it that you don't have these children who are the Bali moment. Why do you have to have aggravation for the rest of your life? So would Rashiva say that this Lamashal that the Machabah says in Evan Ezer, and I, I don't want to, I think it's Simon Bays maybe, he says that a person shouldn't marry into a family that has a, uh, of Nahim. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Would, would, so you see that there's no shame of Sayyam Hashem, even though maybe this will be the healthy child. Would you say that using something like J-Screen <coughs> would sort of fall <coughs> under that general halal? Now we think so. That's exactly what the Gemara tells you. You should be concerned about this. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time, and it's uh, an honor to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a tzlacha. A good year. We have the honor of having with us from Chicago, Harav Hagayin Rav Shmuel first. He's the Rav of the Agudis Yisrael of Chicago. He is the uh, the Dayan of the Aguda, and he the famous Paisik from Chicago. Welcome, Rav First. Yes. So, so Rabbi First, we had on um, we had on um, uh, 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 an individual who who was, uh, who was talking about J Screen, right, Rabbi? We had on Rabbi Jachter and Rabbi Leibowitz, and they were saying that there's a new program that tests the 200 disease, which is far more than what Dari Yisharim tests for. And subsequent to that, we had on a father who told a, tr- a tragic story of he had two children with muscular dystrophy that very likely today um, J-Screen would have screened for and through PGD could have avoided. Could the Rav share with us his opinion about these tests uh, such as Dari Yisharim and now should we even do this greater test which J-Screen is advocating which would could eliminate many, many more diseases. What is your das tire on this? On his deity, I think Dari Sherman is a wonderful organization. They did great things. We haven't had, since Dari Sherman is on the scene, we haven't had any cases of Tay-Sachs because of Dari Sherman in the film community. And they deserve a big yashikayach. I think now they've gone a little bit too far. They're doing tests that it's a mutual animosity very much, you know, 1%, less than 
What happened with Tomim Ti Hashem Lekecha? And they want to start doing this J test. You're mentioning 200 things. I think it's getting out of proportion because you were not mechuyif to go so far. There's such a thing as Tomim Ti Hashem Lekecha and and something that's a mid she'enu matzi ma'od, even muted muted, it's not it's not negaya. I don't think this test should be done, and I think it's it's wrong. And it's I I don't know of any uh, reputable paisik that says you should go this far and do these two hundred tests. I'm not even sure the test that they sure I'm started adding on if the uh, Moshe was nifted. They added on a bunch of other tests. I don't know who was who told them they should do that. I think they went a little bit too far, and they did a great job, and they should continue doing a great job. But I think they're doing too many tests. That really is a meat chain of matzi, and it's ruining shaduchim. It's ruining lives of people. Well, they 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 keep it confidential to the people. They don't they don't tell it to anybody but the person involved. So when you say it's ruining, say it's not, once they say it's not compatible, then you're telling them that this that they have some type of gene which is such a meat chain of matzah, which is nothing. I mean, everyone has genetic problems. There's not a family that doesn't have a genetic problem. What you can do over here at the end of the day is that who knows what's going to happen with shaduchim down the road. I think they're going a little bit too far, or not maybe maybe not a little bit, but a lot too far, and I don't think those tests should be done. I'm well, sure the people out there disagree, but this Lanius Daiti, I think that's the way it's go- they're going too far. <coughs> First, I, I mean, I, I it's a very powerful point you're saying that people won't be able to make shidduchim anymore. Which is, would you be opposed? A, a, a woman who has the BRCA gene, would you, are you opposed to girls testing for the BRCA gene? And as an addendum to that, if a girl has the BRCA gene, should she disclose it in a shidduch? First of all, the BRCA gene, even if they have it, according to information that I'm, t- different types of BRCA genes, but according to information from the doctors I spoke to, and what I saw printed, there's a book that's printed uh, exclusively on this thing, it seems that you can have children, healthy children, and if you want to eliminate the bracket, you can do certain things done after your childbearing age. A woman could do certain type of of, uh, of, of of surgeries, and I know a number of women who did that those surgeries, and Bo Hashem, the, the can, uh, cancer did not come to them because they did the surgery. And they had a high degree of the bracket number, and they eliminated by doing certain surgery. And they were able to have enough ch- all the children they want. And normally, it's done when the woman is already in the 40s already. That's usually what it's done. That's what I'm told. So therefore, I don't know if they should take this bracket test. I think it's it's still bigger than being told to Hashem like Echa. Again, I'm sure, I'm sure that people out there disagree. But in these diet, I tell people not to do the bracket test. But r- 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 first, is it possible to say that the concept of Tamim Tiyam Hashem Alekecha, al Tachgir is something that's not known, whereas somebody being a carrier for a disease is known today. You could know that today, so that it's but not she, really she a Hakira. She can have healthy children. You have the bracket, she can have a bunch of healthy children, and and... And, to, to, and not, for her not to get cancer down the road, she does the certain surgeries that are necessary when she's in the 40s, after she's stopped having children. Would she have she's to healthy, disclose it? She could be a healthy, wonderful mother, wonderful wife, and she can have a healthy life, even with having this bracket. And knowing that she has it, all it's going to do is going to hurt her shaduchim down the road. So it's better not to know. And if there's a problem, down the road they'll take care of it. Now, if if a sibling has BRCA... There's no proof have... that the other one. According to the information I have, there could be five girls, uh, five sisters, two have it and three don't have it. Or it could be what one if... has it and four don't have it. Or it could be all five have it. There's no, there's no, there's no guarantees that every, every sibling will have it or won't have it. So, Rabbi, first, if if somebody 
um, has it, do they have a, a chiv to, despite their maybe interest in privacy, to disclose it to their sibling so their siblings should be aware of their increased danger? I would say they should tell the sibling when they get to a certain age. Why tell her when she's 15 years old? Let her, right. if the sister's a lot older, she has a problem, let her mention it to the, to after she's married, and mention when she's, you know, in the 30s, you know, down the road, I think you should be, check out if you have this bracket thing, and if yes, then get a medical opinion what you should do. Now, the different, according to the information I have, there are different types of brackets. Certain ones are more aggressive than other ones. So she should be checked out by a good doctor. Well, at first, it was a great honor to have you on with us. Thank you so much. Also. We have on the phone with us from New York City, um, Reb Nehemia Kraus, who, uh, rather than me telling his story and introducing him, let me introduce him and let him tell you our story. Welcome, Reb Nehemia. Hi, how are you? Can you tell us a little bit about your story? Um, Share with us. Well, I got married, and I basically... Uh, had two children. I actually, my first child was born approximately three to three and a half years into my marriage. Since it was my first child, I didn't recognize necessarily signs that something was wrong because um, you can't tell right away. He was developing slower, but again, because of that first child, we weren't as aware of it. Um, if it was my second child, I would have realized right away because I would have realized how a, a normal child develops. About uh, t- when he was 10 months old, um, my mother sat me and my wife down. She said she, she thinks there's something wrong with our child. Um, no overt signs, except he wasn't developing at the same rate. Um, at that point, we actually got um, started going to doctors, and we got a diagnosis that he uh, had autism, um, which was kind of wrong, kind of right, as you'll see, and I continue. Um, because of that, because um, we live in such a Medina Shal he got a tremendous amount of services. My Rebbe Movik actually has a child who's autistic, so he linked us up with uh, something called ABA, and I became a little bit of an expert in myself, and we kind of basically really saw a miraculous development in that area. But because we had so many people in the house working with him, um, when he was about uh, two and a half years old, um, a physical therapist, um, it was actually Hasid uh, Yumat I'll tell you about that, he kept on pushing us that we should go back to the neurologist. He feels that something uh, is uh, wrong. Something else is wrong now. Legally, what is, what is your son, what is your child's name? My child's my older child's name is Yaakov Yosef. Yaakov Yosef. After yeah. the uh, okay. no, actually, uh, Yaakov is my grandfather, and Yosef is the Machaber. <laughs> okay. And um, so we finally actually mentioned to him one time. Oh, we made an appointment, and he actually had lived. We were living in Passaic at that time. He uh, he went ahead and said, oh. I went to your appointment. It was Monday, and he wasn't going to be back by my house till Wednesday. He said, I'm going to drive across New Jersey on Sunday. I want to give you something to give the doctor. What he was doing, actually, of course, we had no idea at the time, was he was literally writing a textbook, uh, um, basically diagnosis without actually naming it, of the symptoms, so the doctor would know where to look right away. Um, we didn't understand that until later on, looking back at that letter. Um, ignorance is bliss at that point. Um, so... When we went to the doctor, we gave him the letter. He was very, uh, you know, relaxed. He said probably nothing, but he said let's just do some tests. And basically, uh, then we got the phone call later on that week. I need to see you in my office right away. <laughs> and um, I was like, well, my wife's working, and so we we uh, we worked it out. And it was actually a Thursday night or a Wednesday night. It was a th- Thursday night. And when we got there, he told us that basically uh, my son CPK, which is a sign of muscle breakdown is, was 40, 42,000. In an average person, let's say, I think it ranges from 150 to 300 if they've done a lot of exercise or something like that. And something is, uh, so that gives you a little bit of a rate of the muscle breakdown versus a normal person. And basically he described in detail, I'm not sure why uh, the pediatrician said a lot of people go into denial, so maybe that was his reason. He described in, in great detail what was going to be happening to my child. Um, uh, he actually told us basically by the by the age of nine maximum he's going to be in a wheelchair, and somewhere between 14 and 16 he's going to need to be on a breathing tube, and uh, by 20 he'd basically be gone. And then he said, and you need to test your other children because uh, your other son very possibly has it too. I already had my had second son at that time, and so we didn't test him right away because we needed time to absorb the first one. 
And basically, um, we were living in Passaic, and an opportunity opened up for us to move back to Brooklyn. What was your and your wife's reaction when he told you that your son has muscular dystrophy? So I look at the hashkacha of the fact that we, we thought my son had autism first as, you know, a little bit of a, so to speak, a kind of spoke of appearing us. Because we look back and dealing with the, with the autism, which, again, we had dealt with it, and it, we really got rid of, except for this, definitely always the lifelong effects. Uh, they call it more like an Asperger's we turned it into. But, uh, you know, so that was like a little bit of a softening up. We looked back, and that was almost like a joke compared to what we ended up having to deal with. Our reaction was we were totally stunned. Uh, we don't really remember anything. We ended in like a daze for a few days. I happened to have, a, I happened to have that six months early, become very, very close friends with someone who had lost two children to Tay-Sachs. So uh, he rang our doorbell on Macha Shabbos. Uh, so this is like Thursday night, so much I don't remember. We don't remember much because we didn't really move much between Thursday night and Macha Shabbos. And that's basically, it's interesting. Me and my, my wife both have the same experience. That's when like, our memories start again. <laughs> when, with, uh, and he just rang a doorbell, and he came and he sat down. And, you know, him and his wife were, so to speak, on the other end. And just that, that vision uh, of, uh, of someone on the other end somehow uh, allowed the person to a certain extent uh, to pull through it in a different way. You know, like the like Rav Hanuk Levos Hatzal says, he asks on the Gemara. The Gemara says that Hillel is Mechayev Daniim, and it goes through a whole list of of these individuals that Mechayev all these people. And he says, wait a second, if it's, if it's within the human capability, so why do I need a Hillel? If I'm obligated to learn even if I'm poor, then regardless of whether Hillel is there or not, if I'm not, because it's not within my capability, how does it help that Hillel existed? So somehow there is some kind of a dynamic within the human being that having an actual physical uh, uh, um, image, I don't image is not the right word, um, reality of someone else who, so to speak, gone through and is pulled out, somehow allows the person to reach into themselves and uh, pull out capabilities that they can't do without that. And I'm curious, did you take Darya Sharam tests before you got married? Oh, yeah, of course. But Darya Sharam doesn't test for muscular dystrophy. No, well, first of all, Darya Sharam only tests for things that require um, two parents. Again, this might have changed, but Darya Sharm, my understanding is their policy, they only test for things that require um, two parents as carriers to go ahead and it to occur. Muscular dystrophy doesn't work that way. Even my, even my wife's family, well, first of all, there's two things about muscular dystrophy. First of all, muscular dystrophy has the, the highest amount of what we call a germline mutation, which means that, uh, which is not the case with my wife, which means that uh, a lot of times the mother herself is actually not a carrier and somehow... Um, somewhere between 20 to 60 percent of her eggs mutate when she's being created by the virulum, and she could actually not be a carrier, and still uh, the situation where the children will have muscular dystrophy. But otherwise, in my wife's case, actually, it's very interesting. My wife herself is a carrier, but her mother is not, and her father is not, which means my wife was being created. Her mother's eggs must have spontaneously mutated, and uh, her mother is not a carrier, but my wife is a carrier. So you only need one person to go ahead and have this condition. So Dari doesn't test that. That's number one. Number two, um, Dari really tests for things that they've been able over time to um, bring down, so to speak, the course. Like once we knew what we were looking for, we knew we were looking for muscular dystrophy, it actually cost uh, $6,500 to find a particular mutation that we were dealing with. Now, my kids have a very, very unusual mutation in that uh, the genes are broken down into exons and nucleotides. So most... Mutations are either what we call a duplication, which is an additional exon, or a deletion, which is a missing exon. In my wife's, in my kid's case, one nucleotide in the body, and if you're weird, some genes have over a million nucleotides. One nucleotide, that's what I'm told. One nucleotide in the body is, so to speak, quote unquote, the wrong nucleotide. And basically that causes um, the, the gene to be stopped reading the rest of the gene, so the body can't put out the, the expression. So to test for things like that would be, uh, for, even if it were required to parents, would be prohibited and really expensive. Like I said, once we knew what we were dealing with, because there was a nucleotide level, and by the way, they couldn't even do this till 2004, I think. I think that's what I've been told, to be able to look at the gene on a nucleotide level. Um, so be, people that were much earlier, they would go ahead and test, and they would see that the kid had muscular dystrophy, but they would do genetic testing on the exon level, and they wouldn't even see, they couldn't figure out, like, what's going on, because the gene looks fine. And then you found out about your second son. Right, correct. What's his name? We really, his name is Shimshon Yechesko. We really basically knew, but we, we didn't want to know. We needed time to observe the first one. But once you have your first one and you were told uh, it's a possibility, you start watching and you start seeing things. And you kind of, uh, you know, know. But 
we didn't really um, know definitively, but basically when we were moving back to New York, we needed a definitive diagnosis for the services. Um, but it was really, we really knew because when we got back the results, we didn't even cry because we had a really, we basically knew. Tell us what it's like living with two children who have muscular so it, dep- it depends really how you want to approach it. What me and my wife do is basically we do add, add makim shiari magas. So we basically from the moment they were diagnosed, we became like experts. And often, in fact, High Life One sends new parents to me sometimes to educate them. Sometimes I tell them, don't send them to me yet. They're not ready <laughs> for all the information. Um, so we really we are very heavily involved in their care. So they have 45 minutes of stretching every day because – at the side effect, uh, they take all these medications, and each medication causes other side effects. So they have a severe osteoporosis. They have uh, literally, I think I counted up about, uh, it's 22 sessions of therapy weekly. And that's addition to I take them swimming as much as possible to get them in the pool. Also, we have the mainstream, which is itself a challenge because um, there are some cognitive effects. Um, it's like a little bit of they don't fit anywhere, um, so you, they need a massive amount of support to be able to manage in the mainstream, like during the summer, I actually spend two, three hours teaching them every day to try to help them get through the first few months of the next year. So basically that's essentially what uh, life is, therapy and uh, medicines, and uh, they have a lot of simcha. You know, we always try to keep things very happy, and they're very known for that. They're being extremely happy. So that's are, really... you, are you able to work, given all this? this uh, so so uh, <laughs> me, me and my wife actually both work part-time. We actually have an unusual situation, which works for us and prevents a lot of. And the, we're both very heavily involved in all the aspects. And a lot of, uh, in a lot of situations like this, um, one of the spouse, one of the members of the of the couple, ends up being totally involved in trying to manage um, just the financial aspects, and the other one is totally involved in um, 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 the physical aspects of the care. And it, it becomes they they can't necessarily uh, relate over time, and each one has very very different stresses. So in a sense actually works well because we're both in, in both worlds that way. And uh, I, I really officially, the way I set up my life is I'm supposed to be learning half the day, and that depends whether I have to deal with stuff, which is very often. You're really between all the services and all the things you're really managing, managing a half a million dollar budget of services, and it takes uh, a, a lot of effort and everything involved. And you always have these things thrown at you. Uh, this week, for example, right before we got on the phone, I was dealing with uh, – um, they, the medicine I used to buy from them from England for the last 10 years for so $600 a year, they approved in the United States. So now that it's legal in the United States, you can't buy it from England. And instead of $600 a year, it's $80,000 a year. So we were dealing with that. Baruch um, Hashem, we got it approved um, this week. So that's taken care of. But there's always things. My wife, at night, the amount of time she spends on the phone just dealing with managing the basic aspects of, of everything is unbelievable. Para gets sick or... He can't go to school that day because it's not safe because of his osteoporosis. Um, so you have constant things thrown at you. And then, of course, you know, one of the interesting, interesting things you find out is uh, your, all the regular things that happen to people still happen to you. So on top of that, you know, you still have a situation where you have a, a water table problem in your basement. And if it rains too much, your basement floods. And you still have someone banging into your car and all those other things that still happen, which take people's time. You have to find the time to deal with uh, Besides for this, it's not like uh, something, you're a little surprised in a sense at the beginning, like, hey, I'm dealing with this big thing, so everything else should work out, but it doesn't actually work that way. So let me ask you a question. Do, do you have any other children? Yes, I have, uh, I have thanks to Boney Olam, I have uh, a daughter, she's five years old. And when you say thanks to Boney Olam, they did PGD, is that it? Yes, they, uh, um, actually, the story, what happened was my my sister had got married and her husband lost his mother during Shana Rishona. And what they did, unbeknownst to us, they sent out a letter not mentioning her name, discussing her situation and asking uh, people and Zecha Nishmas, his mother, to go ahead and donate money. And then when they had $20,000, they came to us and they said, uh, here's $20,000, why don't you see what you could do? Um, my daughter is actually named after his mother. So we had uh, approached Boney Olam at that point, but that first $20,000 really <laughs> only just started the process. Uh, I think, I'm not sure exactly, by the time we finished, they probably spent an additional $130,000. Well, then PGD ch- chose eggs, basically, that are not that, that will not will not carry well, forward. Well, it's, it's not as simple as my father put it out. He said, oh, he thought once we contacted Bernie uh, um, uh you know, and the science out there, it's a done deal. It's, 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 it still requires, uh, as everything in life, a tremendous amount of miracles. You have to just 
uh, because uh, right, what PGD does is it takes off a cell on day three out of six cells. So you have to you first have a have a, just a normal process of of IVF, and you know itself it's not automatic. And then when you're taking um, um, one cell off on I think it's day three, um, basically you could collapse a lot of eggs again. The more science developed, the less the risk becomes because they get even high, more higher specialized uh, lasers. But just think of yourself, if someone could cut off one-sixth of your body, even if they would try to do it in the most optimal way possible, think about your chances of, uh, of survival, so to speak. So let me ask you, from the Hamia, do many people have children with muscular dystrophy? The official numbers, the official numbers are, I think, one out of every 3,500 births. Um, I don't know what in the firm community, there's definitely, I mean, I guess the circles we run in, we know a, a lot of them, so, uh, you know, that could also skew your, your view of reality, but uh, there's definitely a very decent amount, and for some reason, when, when we were, uh, it's actually, to me, could be anecdotal, it seems like it's increasing tremendously, because uh, when we, uh, when my kids were diagnosed, I think we were like, seemed like, from what we understood, we were the first family in a few years, and just in the last few years, just constantly. I mean, my son uh, kind of was, uh, so to speak, uh, in his, in one of my sons in his school, he was the first boy with this condition there in their history, and now they have another, uh, I think at least two, maybe even three boys with that there that are mainstreamed over there. And, sounds like uh, a very, it sounds like a very special school. Yeah, but they're mainstreamed in different schools, but both of them, uh, both of them work with, 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 uh, so- so you, how do other parents that you've experienced deal with it? Like, how do they deal with the trauma? With the, are they able to deal with it? It depends. It's it's uh, it's not easy for a lot of people. It's uh, it's it's look it, the the way I look at it is uh, most pain in life is called uh, caused by what we what I call kaya which means imagination. So uh, I remember. Uh, uh, actually, the first time I was exposed to this concept was actually my friend who, who had lost a children's taste sacks. He told me something which I couldn't understand at that point, but I thought about it a lot because I knew he wasn't crazy. And he said to me, if he was raised from the time he was born, that uh, he's going to grow up, he's going to get married, have children, that he's going to take care of them as they die, <laughs> as he put it, then it would have been a lot easier for him to deal with his situation. It was a shocking comment to me. I didn't understand it. Until I realized over time what he was really saying is that um, the hardest part of whether, how a person is going to deal with what happens to them is whether they're going to accept their reality and deal with it as their reality or they're going to live in their imagination still. Um, when a person lives in their imagination, it's very hard for them to move on. So, and it's, of course, a very big challenge because your whole world is completely different than you've ever imagined. Um, so that's really, I find that has a tremendous uh, um, effect in whether people deal with it one way or the other is really, you know, that step about whether they still live in the, in the imaginary world that, you know, that most people get to live in a sense, to a certain extent, or they, or they live in the reality. And that's one aspect. And the other aspect, of course, just, you know, literally getting through the day-to-day life. Can you tell us... Uh about some people who maybe haven't handled it so well that you know of? Yeah, well, um, the, the, according to uh, according to High Lifeline, the divorce rate is astronomical, which is understandable. Um, how high is how high is it? I don't know if the numbers are real, but I don't know I don't know if it's a scientific number, but he I was told at least fifty percent, and that's I think in the firm world, in the in the Gentile world, it's it's much higher than that. And why is that? Well, because. Um, well, first of all, you think of it this way. I'll start, I'll start, uh, there's a lot of reasons, but I'll start off very simple. Um, if you ask anybody uh, um, who does any marriage counseling or anything, et cetera, they'll always say, oh, you have to take, first take care of yourself first, right? But what if literally every time you even want to take care of yourself a little bit, you're doing it at the expense of your child? So then what? Right? So, so what, if, what if there's no such thing as a Sunday because you're literally running around from therapist to therapist. Um, so it's, it's uh, or for example, actually the only time me and my wife get to go away is basically essentially when my kids are at Camp Simple Special and we really need a break because otherwise it's just too complicated to deal with everything that's involved in their care. Nobody could do it. Do you know people who, who were broken by it? 
Oh, of course. 100%. I mean, most people are, I think. Define, like, what does it mean they're broken by it? What does that mean? They look at their life as um, not really um, the life they wanted, and they look at their life as a life of suffering and rather than living. I would define, I don't know if that's a good example, but I would find someone who's broken defines that they're not living life, but they're basically, so to speak, my, I had an aunt, a great aunt, I love Shalom, she used to say at the end of life, I'm pushing the days, which means they're just, uh, so to speak, counting the days and doing what they have to do to get through, so to speak, until the end. I would call that someone who's broken. I don't know if that's a good definition, but off the top of my head. Now, if there are tests out there that can prevent a lot of these diseases, or if there were a test out there that could, you know, before when people get married, they would say, look, you know, you have to do PGD from the beginning because you could have a child with muscular dystrophy. Would you encourage parents to take it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there is a, there are two shittas in halacha, so as far as I understand, but in the literature community, <laughs> it's definitely the halachically viable option. There's, there's nothing to talk about. I, I think... Uh, Excuse the expression, but you have to be literally neat and want to be in a mental <laughs> asylum if you had opportunity and you didn't take it. If you were aware and, and uh, I mean, again, like I said, I'm not, I'm not, I, I wouldn't consider myself a broken person. It's the reality. And, but and if, if, a, if someone was provided with the opportunity and uh, it existed and they were aware, so to speak, that um, it was an issue and they didn't take it, I can't. I, I, I don't even think uh, I don't even think that's uh, a, a realistic thing. I think someone would be insane. I don't think any sane person would actually choose that. The only way someone who is sane would actually consider that a question is if they actually didn't understand the reality. That's the way I would put it. What would you say to the small cadre of rabbanim who discourage testing before marriage? What would I say to them? <laughs> it's not my place to say anything to them. Um, Again, um, it's 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 a tricky it's a tricky business because the question is uh, where Tam Tia Mashalikach ends and where Hishtalis begins. Uh, uh, I can't, if 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 they're if they're, if they're Rabbanim who have so to speak a uh, tremendous standing and they're accepted people who have a uh, clear Masora, then if that's their that's their that's their that's their. Um, so it's not really a place to say anything to them, but um, uh, it, it's definitely uh, it has to be someone who. You know, when when someone's addressing a, a shayla, usually uh, they have to be a, a weir, so to speak, of uh, of, um, of of the actual reality of what they're dealing with. For example, uh, when I first started with uh, IVF and PGD, uh, I don't have permission to mention his name. Um, um, I was relatively close to a uh, tremendous Adam Gadol, and I really wanted him to pass in the shaylas for me, and he really was very which was really responsible of him and responsible of me, he really was really pushy that he really wanted me to go to someone else. And and I was really pushy that I wanted him to because, uh, um, and he ended up doing it, but uh, over time I realized that, and he had no problem, he was really correct because he lacked the expertise in this particular area and the knowledge of it. And, of course, that could also affect, uh, um, that could affect, so to speak, how uh, um, many times if you actually... Uh, understand the reality differently. For example, I know with uh, Copapies, right, one of the questions was affected different sucking by different uh, post chem was, do you see something and you can't tell it's a bug until you put it in the microscope, or you could even see it's a bug if you're trained beforehand, right? So often the mitzias, um could definitely um, affect uh, the halakhic outcome just because you need to have the proper mitzias. Well, thank you very much for talking and sharing the experience, and I hope that you know, I hope that the message reverberates with our listeners. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Cool, okay. We have on the phone with us from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Dr. Daniel Eisenberg, who speaks and lectures around the country on various issues of halacha and refuah. He's a practicing radiologist. He's a, a professor at Jefferson Medical College in the greater Pennsylvania area. He's a graduate of Machon Shlomo. Welcome, Dr. Eisenberg. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, Dr. Eisenberg, we've had a <clears throat> two weeks ago we had on the radio um, uh, Rabbi uh, Leibowitz, and he was speaking to um, to somebody from J Screen, and they were telling us that they do 200 tests 
so some a large number, I don't know the amount, far more than Dari Sharam. And they're able to screen for many issues like, you know, certain muscular dystrophies and many, many other diseases. And then we had on somebody who's the father of two children with muscular dystrophy and who was telling us, you know, the what a living, you know, he, it's 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 sort of, it's a, he said, if you can screen for this and you don't, he said, you're insane. He said, that's what he would advise parents based upon the life that he leads. And I was, as somebody who's an expert in medical ethics, can you give us your opinion on this? Yeah, I think that the question about Dr. Shurin versus traditional medical screening is a question that comes up a lot. And I think it's very important, particularly for your audience, to understand that the medical clinical approach and the Dr. Shurin approach are very different. And what I mean by that is, from a medical point of view, we are interested in identifying all diseases and therefore decreasing suffering, treating disease, is an objective standard. Dor Yashurim's approach is to prevent shaduchim that will result in unacceptable or untreatable suffering. That is, Dor Yashurim is not really in the um, genetics business. And I don't mean that in any derogatory way. I mean that in a positive way. Dor Yashurim exists so that there will not be shaduchim that could cause, um, unpre- a, a prevent- let's put it this way, preventable uh, suffering. That doesn't mean, therefore, that Dershin wants to identify every possible abnormality. That is, I have a son right now going through sh- uh, Shaduchim. And the issue is there are always unexpected things. There are always things you'll never know. The question really is, what would you really like to know? And so, therefore, Dershin has to make a very specific choice as to which things to screen for, because they give a binary answer. Um, I'm presuming that your audience understands how Dershin works. And therefore, when the numbers from Dershin are called in, the answer you will get is either um, acceptable or unacceptable. Given that you're not going to find out what you are a carrier for, Dory Shurin has to take it upon themselves with rabbinic guidance to decide what would be significant enough that we will presume that a third party would not want to date someone if there was a possibility that they could have a child with so-and-so disease. Now, J-Screen Wait, well, let now me, uses let, the same panel as... one second, yeah. Dr. Uh, what sure, what sure. what is percentage is considered significant? Like let's say it was ten percent, twenty percent, two percent. Like do you have an idea of their parameters? Oh, so so um, well, I have these number one significance in the eye of the beholder. But for instance, on medical panels, one of the ballpark numbers they use is that something in the population that has an incidence of one in a hundred or greater is considered to be something significant enough to screen for. But the way the screening works now, it really is not more expensive to screen for 200 diseases than 20 diseases. So therefore, from a medical perspective, if I can identify a gene, I might as well test for it. That doesn't mean that that gene uh, is of uh, hushkafi, I guess, <laughs> importance. Let's say that it would be a, a, a trait that both partners were carrying Right, but that cause that would cause a disease that was treatable. Would that be a reason to call off a shidduch? So that's not a medical question. That is a rabbinical so do question. So do you know? Do you know how? Do you know how? Let's say it's a a one percent chance. What would the binary answer of Dari Sharon be in that case? Well, Dari in advance, it doesn't, they don't work like this. Once Dari Sharon has chosen what they're going to screen for, and if you go to their website, that'll give you a list of exactly what they're screening for, right? So once they have chosen a disease as something to screen for, if both partners are positive, they will say um, it's not a good shidduch. Even if it's less than one, even if it's less than one percent. If they've chosen, if they've chosen that disease, they're not telling. So, do, so do we know? Do you know what their parameters are? Like, at what percentage do they say, "Look, we cut off here because it's not significant enough for us"? I, I think that, to, that that the answer, and I'm not trying to be evasive, the answer is it's not just a number; it's a number combined with how severe. For instance, everyone has heard of Tay-Sachs, and luckily in this population uh, now, in the United States, if a child is born with Tay-Sachs, it's more likely to be non-Jewish, which is very interesting. Um, but Tay-Sachs is such a catastrophe. That's the, that was the topic of Ramosha Feinstein's tshuva in the early 1970s about screening, where he said, you could say, like we say in the Swiss Parsha, right? But he said it's like closing your eyes to a terrible matzah that's in front of you. Now, not everyone would, would, would take the same, it's, and that's a 1 in 30 or so, 1 in 25, 1 in 30 uh, probability. 
There are some diseases that are really, really serious that are less than one in a hundred. Uh, less than one hundred. There are some that are more serious and are less frequent. So the answer would be, I think, a again a rabbinic one, which would be how much do at what point do I say Shom Pesach Hashem? And you don't say that for things that I guess are easily preventable. Um, but we all get in a car and drive, and we all do activities of daily living that have a certain amount of danger. Uh, and so that's, I think, what kind of goes into the whole thoughts. I, I mean, I'd like to point out a few things. For instance, one in two Jews is a carrier for at least one of the diseases on the standard J-screen um, panel. That means half of the people who get screened are positive for something. But it could be unbelievably unlikely, uh, uh, very rare, and therefore it's very, very, very unlikely that any partner is going to also be positive and they're not going to have a problem. One in a hundred couples screened are both carriers for the same condition. So if you go, for instance, to screening at any reputable lab or through J-Screen, one in a hundred couples are going to be, be positive for the same, same condition. And the last very interesting thing is, it's estimated that every person is a carrier for a gene for at least five serious recessively inherited diseases. We just don't know what the genes are yet. Eventually, everybody will wind up being positive for something. And so that's, I'm just dealing with the stigma question from Dury Shurin. Anyway. <coughs> so, um, could you give us, like, when you speak about this topic, well, yes. we obviously have to have somebody from Dury Shurin on to tell us, like, right. what, do they, um, what do they consider significant, right. et cetera. Right. Um, what's your opinion? Do you, do you um, believe in what J Screen does? Because the counter argument to that would be is that if one in every two people is going to have some disease that's carried on J-Screen that maybe could be one in a thousand. In effect, people wouldn't get married anymore. I mean, it, oh, it, so, becomes, okay. a level, it becomes a level of absurdity, right? right? Ah, 100%. So that's it's very, very important to understand, I think, three things. Something called genotype versus phenotype, which means genotype means what genes you have. Phenotype means do they express. So number one, carriers express basically no abnormality. The fact that you are positive for a gene, for a recessively heart disease, does not make you sick in any way. When you go into screen, you're healthy. When you walk out, you're still healthy. It just gives you information. It would be absurd if people were to um, not marry based on something which is um, – I don't know. Let me put it a different way. I'm not sure. The, when you find out that you are a carrier for something, regardless of how unlikely it is, right, you still, if somebody else is a carrier for the same thing, would not want to marry. It's just that the probability of that happening is unbelievably small. So if there was a probability of one in a hundred and, let's say one in a hundred uh, carrier rate, that means the probability of two people who didn't screen randomly um, um, matching up is one in 10,000. So that be, so then the question comes up, do I need to screen for that? But if I could screen for that, and I knew that I was a carrier for this rare um, gene, and that the person that I am being set up with is a carrier for that gene, I probably would not want to date them if it was a really serious disease. So it, the, the screening should not be preventing people from getting even, married. Even if, it's, even if it's one in 100? Yeah, because the, it's, it's 100% once you have it. That is to say... I, talk, I understand that, right. but... But there's, you know, if, if you say one in two people is going to be a carrier for a rare disease, you know, we just as for it is disease, for a disease on the panel. I understand. So, so yeah. as it is, shidduchim is so fraught with. We have a shidduch crisis now. No, no, I understand. If we want to layer on the shidduch crisis, say, you know, now if there's a one in a hundred chance we're not going to go out with that person, etc. But, but well, it doesn't. But it doesn't just, work with it. That I, I think that's a misunderstanding of the way the screening works. Because it's not an issue of, cha of, of chance anymore. If you go in and you get screened and find out you are a carrier for an exceedingly rare um, disease, you have the gene for the disease, you're healthy, right? All that tells you is, at the moment, that the probability that you'll meet somebody else with the same gene is unbelievably unlikely. So that means, assuming the girl also is screened, the probability that someone's going to set you up with something like that is one in 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. But if uh, you were to be set up with, it, with, with someone, would you really want to marry someone when you know 100% that you're both carriers? That is, you're not, you're not choosing to, to um, not get married because of the probability that someone has something. The whole point of screening is you know, and you've, ex and you've excluded the possibility. So the point would be, if I put something on that 
panel that has a one in a thousand chance, which would be unnecessary because the probability is so low. But I did it. And for some strange reason, you wound up positive for this gene. And then someone went to sit with a girl who also screened as positive for this gene. There's now a one in four chance if you get married that each child will have the disease. But wait, the wait, probability that will happen is... Ex- it, yeah, but the probability it happen is what? What do you mean? That is, I'm saying if if somebody who's one in a thousand, uh, that's it's a one in a thousand that their child will have that disease. Is no, that really somebody? No, no, says, no. That's not the okay. way. It's one in a thousand. When you walk in, I I I, I suggest to you, let's say you well, go in. The carrier, the, you mean? Right. I go one in. One in a thousand is a carrier. The now, carrier. Now, let's say two people who are carriers of this disease get married. At what point? What are the odds that they have a child with it? If disease? two people with the same gene, one in four. Yes. One in four. Oh my God! So that's already very significant. Right, but I'm saying but no, but that's what it's with these three things. It's very important. So genotype versus phenotype, gene versus disease, right? We all have have a certain number of chromosomes. They are doubled. We have 46 chromosomes, yeah. and you need two of each gene for for each trait, right? Some traits, if you have one gene for it, will express, and that's called the dominant disease. Some things you need two genes for. All right, in a, in a kind of in a strange sense, I could say to you that brown eyes is a dominant condition, and blue eyes is a recessive condition, and the probability of two people who marry who are carriers for blue eyes, meaning two people with brown eyes but are having, but have a gene for blue eyes, one in four chance they'll have a child with blue eyes, but we don't object to blue eyes. This one in four has nothing to do with the carrier rate. It has to do with the idea that if two people with the same trait, right were to have children, each child has a one in four chance of, of having that trait. If that trait is Tay-Sachs, you want to avoid that at all costs. If that trait is blue eyes, you may <laughs> be happy to have that, that trait. So the idea of testing for things that are very unlikely should have no impact on the Shadok crisis. Because, so Dr. Dr. Eisenberg, are yes. there diseases that if two people are both carriers, yes. the odds of them having a child, notwithstanding the fact that they're both carriers, with that these are still very remote. Are there diseases like that as well? I'm not sure. I care for the question. I'm not sure I understand. <clears throat> Let's say you have yeah. disease X that one in a thousand people, yeah. one in five thousand have it, right. marries somebody else by unfortunate coincidence. Right. They're a carrier. Also is a carrier. Right. Are there diseases that notwithstanding the above, the chances of them having a child are still only one in a hundred? No. Because it's, no it's, in other words, if two people if are both carriers... The, the chances go up more than incrementally. They grow up dramatically, and it, should they be unlucky and both have this disease at that point? No, no, no not this disease. It's very important. If they are likely and both are carriers for the gene, they're both. The chances healthy. of their children then having it are one, one in four. four. Assuming it is recessively inherited. So then, disease. so then, what's the argument not to um, have not to use J screen? Like I heard Rabbi first say, well, Tamim Tm Hashem Kecha. Um, you know, it's just such a remote thing. Well, it's not remote if they're both carriers. Okay, so and it's answer, not tumbling anymore because you could check for it now. It's an excellent question. And that's why I started out saying that medical clinical approach is identify all disease. And reassurance approach is to, um, to prevent shaduchim that would be problematic. So at this point, we have, they have to ask the question and say, to what, how likely does something have to be for me to worry about it? But it's not me. It's it's Dury Shuren. That is, Dury Shuren has to decide what is it worth testing for, and I'll tell you why. Let's say, and this is again a a, a uh, absurd analogy, but let's take blue eyes as the trait, right? Blue eyes is a recessive trait. Now the question is, what would happen if Dury Shuren decided that they're going to put blue eyes on the, on, on the panel, and two people come up positive for blue eyes, and they only give binary answers and say yes, it's a match, or no, it's not a match. Well, if the answer is that we don't care about blue eyes, right, then you're going to say it's a match. Why bother testing for it? Your Dory Shuren is only going to test for those things, I presume, that their rabbinic advisors are telling them are significant enough that we're both to be positive, um, they will um, say no. Now, you're asking a good question. I don't know. It is worth asking Dory Shuren the question about how it, whether there's an incremental cost and that may be the answer, and that may be reasonable. For instance, I could build a car that would significantly decrease risk of death in driving, and I'll call it a Sherman tank. 
but it'll cost you five hundred thousand dollars. It'll drive five miles an hour, and it'll use one gallon of gas, you know, per mile. So the answer is no one will buy it. So it, it's always a trade-off between how much do I um, spend, how much do I give up, how much time do I spend to save the, the probability of saving this many lives. And every life is valuable, but there still is the question of there's no limit to how many things I could test for. So the medical approach is to say there's no uh, ethical issue. Test for everything. You should know. Know what you have, and then knowledge is power. right? But, but that's not what Dory Sharon set up for it. The other thing is Dory Sharon's audience, their, their target audience, are people, I think, who don't really understand necessarily the intricacies of, of genetics, which is perfectly fine. Dory Sharon is set up for people who just want to know the answer to whether or not it's okay for my son to date this girl. Right? Um, I think it's a very interesting distinction. Rabbi Bleich and, Ra- and Ramosha had a disagreement as to how to scream. Rav Moshe's tshuva is what led to Dori Shurin, is my understanding. Rav Moshe and his tshuva, after the Tay-Sax screening test came out, said, screen but, screen but sinna, don't do it in, uh, in, large, in, in shivas, in seminaries, don't tell people, you know, because cause teenagers have nervin, he says, they, get, they make a big deal out of, out of small things, and there's a big stigma. And interestingly enough, he said that even though the doctors tell you that if two carriers marry, there's no chance of having a child. People don't believe it. But that's a little bit of an issue of ignorance. Not Obviously, not at Ramosha's point. He is saying, what can I do? The reality is there's a stigma attached to marrying a carrier. But there shouldn't be, and it's not even clear today that there still is. Rabbi Blythe, in an article, writes and says, a downside to, the, to this approach, the Dory Shorten approach, is it turns it into what seems like a Byzantine, hocus-pocus um, process. That is, if I tell you that there's information about you, and I'm going to test you for it, but I won't tell you what it is, that seems to imply that it must be something that's really bad. Because if it wasn't bad, why wouldn't I tell you? So the real question has to come up today, is there really a stigma attached? The only possible downside would be to say, if I marry a carrier, there's a possibility my children will be carriers, but carriers are healthy. And Ramosha thought that that's not a, being a carrier is not a significant um, problem. It's not a uh, uh, pagum. And therefore, right, best to just let people know that it's okay to marry. But I mean, it's really important to understand the test, and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. Recessively inherited diseases. If two people are carriers, there's a one in four chance of having a child who's affected. It doesn't matter what the disease is. Um, it just matters whether we care enough to make sure that that doesn't happen. And Tay-Sachs was fantastic. It was basically eliminated from the Jewish population due to screening. So Rabbi Blythe believes we should tell everybody what the issue is. He goes further. He thinks children should be screened at birth. He thinks there should be mass screening when children are born. In, in, in this country, there are multiple diseases like this that every single child is screened for in the hospital at birth. Right? This is called fetal ketonuria. Fetal ketonuria is a recessively inherited disease. Every child in this country is tested for it at birth. And the reason they test is very simple. Because if you know that the child has it, you can modify their diet and it's treatable, and they, the life is fine. If you don't know they have it, and you don't modify their diet, they become very sick. So therefore, it's, it's valuable to know whether or not they have it or not. Right? There are other diseases, for instance, which are, you can't do anything about. Right? And therefore, the state does not test for them. And I think there's 30 different, uh, at this point, 30 different of these um, diseases that children are screened for in the hospital. I don't know how many people realize that. And the reason is because so they're treatable. So you're an advocate for, of J-Screen, is that it? Um, uh, uh, the truth, I am an advocate for screening. For, for instance, my children have gone through Dory Shurin, right? That does not mean that they're going to do the exclusion uh, necessarily, everything else. But the world in which I travel, my son was in Philly Shiva for eight, for eight years, right? This, in this, the, there's a social context to, to the screening. The social context is a community in which people are going to go on strict shaduchim, meaning no one's going out with somebody that they just met somewhere. They are only going out once the, both families have agreed. Dory Shurin is a spectacular and successful way to do this, with the understanding that it doesn't test for so many things, but it tests for some really big ones, and it makes a significant dent in the number of, of um, sick children that are born. Right. So that's Dr. 
Dr. Eisenberg, I want to know if you'd be willing to come on to the phone if we can get Dari Sharam to like do a three-way with you and Dari Sharam. Would that sure. be okay? Sure. sure. So let's reconvene. I want to thank you very much. Thank you. No, thank you yeah, so sure. much, Dr. Oh, you're welcome. Okay? Thank you very much. Yep. Hold the Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. We have on the phone with us from Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Gideon Weitzman, who is the Rav of Pua. Welcome, Rabbi Weitzman. Thank you very, very much. Rabbi Weitzman, for our maybe less than knowledgeable American crowd who doesn't know much about PUA, can you tell us a little bit about PUA, what it does, how many people it employs, how many calls or whatever services it does a year? Give us a summary. Okay, of course. I'm very happy to. Thank you very much for having me on. The PUA Institute was established over 20 years ago in Israel. We now we started with very small and humble beginnings and now have uh, branches all over the world, including in North America. We have an office in New York. We have a, an office in Los Angeles, um, in Europe, in South Africa, Australia. And the PUA today does really three things. Uh, we have 12 or now uh, almost 15 Rabbinim who answer questions. I'm one of them. Uh, all questions related to fertility, gynecology, intimacy, women's health, contraception, um, birth, uh, after birth, Tarat uh, um, we give, we not doctors, but we give, explain the procedures, uh, give halachic advice, obviously give psak, and uh, give referrals where people should go to, what treatment they should undergo. We also supervise fertility treatments all over the world, including in North America, throughout North America, South America, Canada, and throughout Europe, Israel, as, as we said before, Australia, South Africa, to ensure that there's no mistake made in the lab. Um, we've prevented um, um, dozens of such that mistakes that otherwise would have happened were not for a lack of supervision of poor. And the third thing we do is educate. We educate uh, doctors, rabbis, the public, men, women, uh, in order to be more uh, knowledgeable and more aware of the issues of, um, as we said, of the uh, Fertility, intimacy, genetics, um, adolescence, and uh, tarata mishpacha. That's really what we do in a nutshell. We have and about. Uh, say, uh, yeah, yep, yeah, we have example. about hundred. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. You have a hundred. We have about a hundred. So we have about. A, I just said how many people. So I'm just. We had about a hundred. We have about a hundred supervisors worldwide. As we said, we have fifteen rabbinim, and uh, small office staff uh, in, in America and in Israel. So, for example, here in America, we have an organization that works on fertility is actually two. What would you do that's different than them? Well, you have Bonne Olam. Bonne Olam started off giving money, um, and that's really their spec, and they also give advice um, around their giving money, which is a, a complementary to what PUA does. They service a slightly different community, and there are certain things that because they are giving funds, so they... Uh, will decide that they, their funds are best spent in one place and not in another place. Um, A-Time is a support group, is, a, is an organization set up by people who went through fertility, who support other people and to be a, 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 a shoulder to, a, a, a support and to be able to, uh, to assist them. But um, they don't do, uh, we are more of a professional organization, not someone that's been through it necessarily. We have a wider network, we're international. And um, there are a lot of things that, that the three organizations do that are similar, but as I said, I think we service a slightly different clientele, uh, and I think we have a wider um, net of things that we deal with. Well, so what's your position on genetic screening? Um, first of all, do you believe it's halachically required? What is Pua's position? And then let me um, let me make it a little more complicated. There is an Amer- there are in America two. Um, different ways to do it. There is, um, you know, there's the famous screening that everybody goes through, Shaduchim, you know, I did it myself. Sorry, and that which, no. which tests for, you know, basically a small number of diseases. I think it's more, but they used to be, but it's, I don't know, 20, 30, 40. And then there's J-Screen, right. which runs a panel of hundreds of tests. What is right. PUA's position about, A, should we get screened, and B, um, which screening is better, the Dari or J-Screen? Just to just to clarify, because you know, for me and for your re- your your listeners, you're talking about premarital genetic screening. Which Correct. Which means not that we're talking about a woman who's pregnant and we're going now prenatally to test. No. Let's no, see what no, the state of the 
but we're talking about a couple that are coming to get married who would want to know is this a good marriage or not. So let me give a little bit of I'll give a little bit of history and then I'll tell you my position, our position in Pua. So a little bit of history is that the first people to start off doing any genetic screening, not only in the Jewish world, but pretty much in the world at all, was Doi Sharim. And no one had ever done any genetic screening before, and it came to because the famous story that Rabbi Eckstein, the founder he had himself, was a carrot Tay-Sachs, his wife was a carrot Tay-Sachs, and they had children who died of Tay-Sachs. And therefore, he said, this is, this is ridiculous. We know about Tay-Sachs. There's no reason it should happen. And all the Rabbanim came out against him, uh, pretty much, because they said, once you test everybody, we're going to take more and more mishpachat anichfim. As the Mishnah tells us, a person shouldn't marry a woman from mishpachat anichfim. We won't have a tainted family. And so, you're going to create more and more tainted family. But he came up with a brilliant and a unique idea, and when I speak to my non-Jewish colleagues, which they are amazed about it, that we have a a serial number. You don't get an answer, you get a serial number, which means you get a number on a computer, and when the young bacher and the young girl come to think about getting married, not when they get married, when they think about getting married, they check the numbers, and if they both have the same recessive genetic abnormality, they say to them, that's a problem, you can't get married. And if they don't, they say, go ahead. So that's what they're that's what they did, and it's an amazing, unique, and phenomenal uh, organization that has basically, in one generation, eradicated Tay-Sachs. And as you said correctly, over the years, they added more things to their panel. I think they have 15 as their regular panel. You can have some more if you know. And that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, way to treat a very specific problem, which is known, recessive, common genetic abnormalities. There are in the community things that are not recessive, that are not, it depends who you marry. For example, BRCA gene. The BRCA gene is a very common gene in our community. It causes certain types of female cancers, mostly ovarian and breast cancer. It is a very, it's common. If you think in the North America, 0.3% of the women have BRCA. In the Jewish community, 2.5% of the women have BRCA. So it's a very common in our community. And that, Doisha, obviously doesn't check. Why? Because if you have the BRCA gene, it doesn't matter who you marry. And so there are a lot of things that are not really, that don't fall into what Doisha should say we should do. Because they are genetic things that are connected to that specific person, ir- irrespective of who they marry. So we have to make a, a serious distinction between those two. So... Deutschland is a wonderful organization. It, it solves a very specific problem. However, the disadvantage is it's a closed system. You don't get an answer, yes or no. You get a number. And a lot of people uh, don't want to get a number. They want to know what they have because knowing what you have has certain importance. On the other hand, we don't want to create mishpachat um, So that makes sense? Which is brought by Allah. I believe the Shulchan Aruch is the Bay. It has the Bay. It brings that by Say it again. I Sorry? said it's the halacha mishpachas nechsim is brought not only the gemara but the Evan Ezer and Sivit Beis. Sure, so you don't have to create mishpach. You don't have to marry mishpach donichim, and we don't want to create mishpach donichim. And so the um, and so what I think the poorest position is that genetic testing in pre-marriage is a good thing, and uh, for many people, Dori Sharmin may solve their problem, and that possibly after marriage a couple might want to add the certain things that are specific for them that have not been covered by Deutsche, and such as we said, the BRCA gene is one example, or, or Fragile X, and other things that are examples of things that are not. However, if we have a couple that are, they know they have a genetic abnormality before, because there's something in their family, so Deutsche doesn't really answer their need. If we know that, uh, if we have a couple who maybe come from different ethnic backgrounds, so he's Ashkenazi, she's Sadi, and they have different things that don't really covered by Dori Sharim. And so we'd have to look at the each case specifically to see whether that was something that there was a need to have, uh, the, whether Dori Sharim answers their need or not. Um, but so right, I think Dori Sharim right. answers for a very specific community. I don't think it answers for everybody. That's what I would say. Yes. And so would you, J Screen, which does 200 plus tests, would right. you have, so if somebody came to you, a regular boy and girl, garden variety boy and girl, you know, um, um, Yaakov and, and, and Rachel, and they say, do we, should right. we do Darius Sharim or the, or the very big screening? 
what would you say? What, how do you advise them? Again, it depends what to me. What do they want to know? They they already a couple. They want, they want to know, know maybe, should we get married? Maybe there are some other weird diseases that 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 Zari Sharm doesn't test for. That through their marriage they will exponentially increase the odds of having them. Right. Right. Uh, right. Should they do it or not? And they're low. They're low risk. Let's, I mean, let's let's get they're your. They're just a regular boy making. and a regular girl. They come from low. Family. So they're low risk. The chances of them finding something that's going to make an impact is low. It's not very high. The right. question then would be: Would they get married anyway or not? So if they're well, saying we we're never going to get married until we test, the problem is that we can over test. You know, Deutschland did a good thing. They had a cutoff point in which they said that something that's that's uh, such and such a, 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 a parent, it appears such and such a time, that's something that we're going to test. We're not going to test everything. And so there are companies, I don't, I don't want to get into any specific company, that will test lots and lots and more things. And right. some of those things possibly are not so, not so uh, significant. I know, for example, the J-Screen has a policy that they'll only test things that, have, um, a very, that are life-threatening. You can go to other companies that will test things that are not life-threatening. They will say, you know, we can test lots of things that may have an impact on your life, but are not really life-threatening. And so those things, I think, are probably not necessary to come before you get married. Again, because you're saying, I'm not going to get married if we both have this recessive gene, which is extremely rare. So if a, a, a young man comes to me and says, I want to know what I have, Dory Shank doesn't answer your question. You can only answer that if you go to a regular company that's going to check, have what we call open testing, that you know the answer. Sure. Uh, but if it's a couple say, we, we're thinking about getting married, should we, and we just, we just want to know the regular things, and, we, we, and then afterwards we'll check it out, and then we'll, we won't not get married, we'll get married, but we want to know what we have, then I would say, do I share will answer your need immediately to get married? I, and we know and the difference. You I'm asking you, Rabbi, get, Rabbi right. what, what's your opinion? Would you, would, you, the, would you send your kids? Would you send your kids to J Screen or to Darius Sharam? I um, again, it's, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm covering it because this is the way we work in Pua. I think Pua works differently than lots of other places. Every case is case specific. So my question is, what are they asking? So if they are asking, we want to know these things. Do we have it? Then Darius Sharam answers your question. If my children would say, I want to do Darius Sharam, that's great. However, if they would say, I want to know what I have, and I'm not, for me, being a carrier is not mishpachat anichfim, then I would say J-Screen is a, or J-Screen or a similar organization would be a good answer for you, an option to you. That's why I think that we have to be clear that doi sharim answers a need. It's not we have to get rid of doi sharim because it's, you know, it's already it's passe. It's not true. Doi sharim answers a very important need. And so why wouldn't and other you, organizations why answer. wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you go to J-Screen and just eliminate risk? If it doesn't cost any more money. So that's a good, if it costs exactly the same and you would say you're going to get the same information, yes. Why not? Because I think there are a lot of people that, are that being a carrier, they view as being mishpachat and nichem. And I go back, as I said, that's why the history was important. Of the Rabbanim that came against, out against Jewish emotion, including Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and others, who came out against it and said, we, we're, we're going to taint these families. So if you're in a community that being a carrier is a taint, is a, is a mum, is a tainted family, is a mishpachat anichsen, then that is not something you want to get because you're going to find that information you don't want to know. And I wanted to I would say more than that. I think that today, and I had this discussion actually with somebody in, in J-Screen, that we are testing and finding out information in the area of genetics today. We know much more information than we know what to do with i.e. we're finding out a lot of information, we don't really know what's the ramifications of this genetic abnormality. We don't know what it will lead to. We don't exactly know where it, where it will go. And so we sometimes over-test. We have to understand that as well. Sometimes the over-testing is not always, not all knowledge is good knowledge. Not all knowledge is going to help you in your life. But if you're the sort of person that you can handle being a carrier, and that will limit who you can marry, but it will still not necessarily destroy your life, then open testing may have an advantage. So let me tell you if, if this summary, I'm going to try to summarize what you said. J, uh, <clears throat> J Screen does a much wider set of tests for more remote diseases that are, but I mean, when parents have them, for example, like multiple sclerosis, 
I'm sorry. Um, um, what did we have? Uh, I, I apologize. Cystic My brain is uh, cystic fibrosis that others don't test for, and um, you know, and, and and when two carriers of cystic fibrosis, it exponentially increases the possibility, right? Yeah. But it's but it's somewhat remote, and uh, and they won't. I, mean, do I, it. I think actually Dory Shen does cover. Well, maybe that there's some more recent. And some of the mutations. <laughs> but I, I understand you. There are rarer things. You look on the panel of. There are rarer things. And, and, and the attitude is, and I think we've heard some rabbin and basically express it. They said, you know, <laughs> at a certain point, you know, you, you become where people just don't want to get married. I mean, everybody. Imagine if you could test somebody at the time of dating for um, ability to one day earn a living. Ability to, you know, bring, how they would bring up their children, anger issues. Maybe I wouldn't be married. Depression. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't know think anybody, anybody would end up getting married. And part of life is, is like, you know, we weren't to, to, to work out issues and, and carry each other through, you know, uh, tough times, be they emotionally tough times, physical tough times, or psychological tough times, or financial tough times, etc. That's what marriage is about. But again, and I think it's a, I, so if I we think wanted you're, to you're, scrub out, right. if we want to describe out, nobody would get married. What they are basically saying, Jay, uh, 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 Dari Sharm, is look, things that are davar matzay that you have to be chayshish for, and it's staring at you. If you don't do it, you're bordering on a poshaya. So that's where Jay Square, that's where Dari Sharon does. And Moshe has a chew, but it seems to suggest that as well. That, that the thing yeah. that you could find out, you didn't find out, is not Tamim Tiyam Hashem Elokecha, it's craziness. Having yeah. said that, there are solutions today. A couple of things, I have a couple who got married, knowing that they're both were carriers of serious genetic abnormalities, that as you said, have a great chance of having children who will have that, who will be sick, and who will be, and life will be threatened. There are solutions that we can do today. There PGRD, are, you're there is, there's to PGD. Imagine. There are things that can be done. And so a couple might say, but I want to know that because we're going to get married anyway. We'll, we, we, we love each other. We think that we can support each other. All of the things you just said, which are as important as being healthy. We're going to have a panasa and we're going to be uh, learn Torah. And we're going to be, our, our, our Shabbos table will be the, be the best ever. But we have a genetic abnormality, but we're going to have children. We want to know that information because we're going to have children through PGD, and then our children hopefully will be healthier than they would otherwise. So such a person, Doi Shen doesn't answer that question, and they would need an open testing. So again, it's very, very much case-based. And I think, again, both all of the organizations, there's a reason why there's Doi Shen, and there's a reason why there's j -Suite. The reason why there's Doi Shen is that it answers a need, but not for everybody. And therefore, J-Screen answers a need, but not for everybody. There are people who will never do J-Screen. There are people who will never do do sharing So between them, I think that they that we, we cover. And I think what both of them, that's very important, that's why we're having this conversation today, uh, is, is what both of them have done is put genetic screening on the map. They've made it legitimate in our, in our community, where it was not... 20, 30 years ago. No one, no one did genetic screening. And Deutsch Schoen came along and said, it is legitimate, it should be done. And J-Screen has benefited from that and saying not only is it legitimate, but there are other ways of doing which is also legitimate. And that debate is incredibly important and has saved our community in one generation. I'm saying there's no other community in the world that has that, that has been able to, in one generation across the community, basically eradicate well-known genetic diseases that they have, and that we should be very proud of that. And I, I want to say that we've had Rabbi Eckstein on the phone, and to me, he's like the Noyach, like in respect, like he's almost like Noyach, one person who, who changed the entire world, a Chesidisha yeah. fellow, without an education, our community owes such incredible Hakara Satayv, and 100%. you see the impact, like, you know, when we say in Chazal, that how one person is like the entire, here is one person who's had an impact on our entire world, one lone individual. He's Noyach and the Teva is what, yeah. is really what Rabbi Eckstein, the incredibly courageous and the person with vision has had on our community. Sure. And I hope the poor does it, has done a similar thing in fertility. I hope that it's put it on the map and people are speaking about it. It's not embarrassment. We just had a conversation about, you know, egg donation and, and, and surrogacy. These are issues that appear in our community and need to be discussed as well. And it's not an embarrassment to have them. And I think it's also a trailblazer to be able to do that. 
So what is the message of Pua? Like you say that there's embarrassment, et cetera. Like what, what area is there of embarrassment that if you say, wow, if there's this one thing that I could just, this message, what would it be? I think that we have to realize if we go to Pua's original uh, 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 spec and what we continue to do and I hope we do well is to deal with fertility is exactly what you just said about, and I, and I very much appreciate and res- resonate what you said about Rabbi Axel and I agree with you, is that it could be a trailblazer in the area of fertility in three ways. A, to tell, to inform Rabbonim that this is, this, this is available, it can be done with Pialocha, it can be done with Hashlocha, there's no mistakes made in the lab, it is something that is legitimate and can be done. The second is to look at the doctors and to say that doctors, there are the specific needs of the from Jewish community and we can help them. There's no reason why a couple shouldn't undergo treatment because of the, because of halacha or because somehow they're, 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 it's not available to them. And the third, I think, is, is to help the couple is that a couple who experience infertility believe that they are alone. No one else is with them. They're the only people in their entire family, their entire shul, their entire community who has fertility problems and to let them know that that is not the case if it's someone that first of all it's a very common occurrence and there are many people who are experiencing it and they don't know about and the to, to give them somebody to empathize with them to speak to them i think that all the couples the, the doctor they said the doctor wasn't very nice to me i said you don't need the doctor is nice you want someone to be nice i'll be nice to you they said they have no one to speak to don't speak to the, the people who do you feel are not are not validating you? Come to speak to me. And so our ability to help those couples, and they avail themselves of treatment, and they're successful. And there are thousands of children. We get about 150 calls. Uh, sorry, we get about 200 calls every day here in Eretz Israel, and we get more calls around the world. And we we are involved in the birth annually of about 1,500 Jewish children worldwide. And that's a phenomenal number of people who are being helped, who are looking for help, and who need help. And we're happy to be able to say this is available to you. Now, Rabbi, Rabbi White, so what do you say to, the, there, are, there are Paiskim or Rabbanim I've seen, who say that, you know, doing things like, you know, egg donors, it's against the Torah, Tamim Tiyem, Hashem Alakecha, it's a question of Klayim, it's a question of you being Mishana the Bria, we have the right mm-hmm. to tinker with God's world. What do you? How do you respond to that? So, if a couple would come to me and say, "We hold my a rug who holds you can't do regulation," you said before you mentioned surrogacy, which is a rare. I'm saying that not, that's not such a common occurrence, but we'll take surrogacy. I have had couples that I went to their home and I sat with them, or their rebbe, and I sat with them, and they said it's a sore. The answer to that couple is it's a sore because your rug won't permit it, and that's okay. So that's perfect. Everybody has to go with their. Rabbi, there are Rabbanim who permit it, there are Rabbanim who are there. If your Rabbi is Oisir, that's your Psak. If your Rabbi is Matthew, that's your But how do you respond? That's on a practical level. How do you intellectually respond to Rabbi who says, <clears throat> we are not, don't play Hashem, don't play God, um, you know, Tamim Tiyem HaShav Alekecha, don't be Mishana Maisa Bereshit, etc. How would you respond intellectually to him? I mean, on a pure intellectual level, not on a halachic, not on a halachic level. So I'm saying in how would you respond in learning? Forgetting about right. the, what, the learning, how would you I respond? I mean, I think that, you know, if we just look at the history, and I think it would be a very, very fascinating history book to look at how, when IVF first came out, when they first did a regular in vitro fertilization, almost all the Rabbonin came, again, came out against it and said exactly what he said, Mishan Abrias, there's going to be under the Musia, we're not going to know, it's going to be, you're going to have very strong, is there, is there, is there a, not really, and it's all going to be a big, big mess. The mice is today, almost all the Rabbanim Matir IVF, you said about Rabbi Yoshev, um, you know, Rosh Lamazam, the Vosner, all of the Poskim were, were Matir, and the Hasidic Poskim were Matir IVF. Why? A, because it became extremely common. B, because there was Hashkocha to make sure it was okay. And C, there was an awareness. So why doesn't that why isn't that Mashana Bria? Why isn't that Mashana Bria? You came to the realization that that's really the hand of the Kodesh Baruch Hu in this is how the, the development of the Kodesh Baruch Hu gave us in the same way that we have treatment for all sorts of other ailments and all sorts of other conditions. 
Um, egg donation is in a very different category. It is third party. Third party is elective. No one has to do it. I don't know if you're making the mitzvah kuru by having a child through egg donation. It's a very good child. Those are pashut. Um, and so, but but on some level, that couple is experiencing a something that's akin to a machala, akin to an illness, and this is the treatment that we have for them. And so, uh, are there things that we become overly playing the hand of a kodesh baruch The answer is probably yes, and I would shy away very very carefully from those things. But I think since there are a bonum that say that okay, like what? Give me an example. Say, like what would you shy away from? Um, I mean, things in which we are changing genetic makeups, and we're, as you said before, eradicating unwanted genetic traits, which may actually not be at all life-threatening. We can do today PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, to get a child to find up the child's height. I want a child. I don't want a child that's small. I want a child. Designer baby. Talk about a dwarf. We want a, a I want a child that's going to be a like, designer baby. That's already a very, very problematic area. Because then really you're deciding that, that this trait is not wanted in a Kodesh Babu's world. That's a big problem. That's a very big problem. However, um, if we have a, a, a procedure, medical procedure, that's uh, almost, you know, but the idea is basically natural. You take an egg, you take a sperm, you put them together. So it's true that, that we do it through the doctors, but it's essentially copying the, the natural norm. Um, egg donation is more big a problem. I said there was a couple that came to me recently, uh, and they had several. So they had already several children. And during, unfortunately, a very very difficult birth, the wife had to remove her uterus in order to save her life. And they then wanted to use a gestational carrier to, um, in order to have children. And I talked them out of it because I thought that if you have, if it's something that's uh, that's that's almost pikuach uh, nefesh. In the fact that if you have no children, to have any child, you have to most message. But if a couple already have children, and this has happened sort of through a, an unfortunate, but almost <laughs> natural Rabbi White, occurrence. Uh, Rabbi White, yes. so let me interrupt. We would both agree that there's certainly no mitzvah, be'er of al-tanach yadecha, there's no chiv of be'er of al-tanach yadecha to have to go through just a In this case, carriers. for example. There's not going to be a rubber in the example. world who would, who would disagree with that. So. And then we can go even more than that. A, couple, a woman who just says, I'm not I have children, I have nine children. I'm postmenopausal. I want to do egg donation. Where can you say that's not yeah. egg donation yeah, wasn't so. for your case? And so there are Rabbi, clear things that would, that would say that's already there's a natural process. But the, Rabbi, real, Rabbi, the reality you, is yes. Yeah. Well, let me ask you another question. How would you respond to a woman, a girl, who went through J screen, and she does have um, the BRCA gene, or yeah. you know, fragile eggs, etc. Some of these serious, serious uh, issues. At what point should she, she, she does she have a chiv to disclose it while dating? Um, oh, and so uh, what? How would you? How do you respond? To it? How do you deal with that? That's the million dollar question. And the question is basically, you know, this again is that the question is, is it a mecca coat? At what point would somebody want to know that? Um, and so fragile X, in which. We know that there's a high chance of her having children. It depends on how many repeats it is. We're not going to get into the technical technicalities. But fragile eggs in which there's a high chance she would have children who would be seriously sick is maybe different than BRCA, than BRCA, in which it's possibly a woman who may get cancer later on in her life. But then again, chasa chalila, anybody could get cancer later on in their life. And so she's at a greater risk, but it's not... Um, there's a two different situation scenarios. I think that if you test it and you know that you have a genetic abnormality that's, a, that's dominant, for example, or you have a BRCA gene, then you would have to share it. I don't. I, otherwise, I think today we would consider that mekhtot. How would not, if you if the man had known, he would have thought that was a mum. That's a kunta locha. That's a mekhtot. If he'd have known it and he thought it was a mum. Um, yeah, but respectfully, Rabbi Weitzman. If if Braca becomes a mechastias, right, the fact that she knows it or doesn't wouldn't make a difference. In other words, if somebody buys something, a cow from somebody, and right. they right. find out afterwards that it it, it really uh, it's missing, it's a very it's missing a very component that the the, and the seller did it know, it's still a mechastias, right? Or if you buy it, or mechastias is not contingent upon the seller knowing it to you, it's whether the buyer, but it is contingent so on something that's matzuri. 
It's not saying on, on it being Matsui. So if we I say, but, but, I had a question like so, this recently from somebody. Look, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask that, you let me just finish my point. My yeah, point is this, if, we, if we're going to say that a brachajit is something that a guy would say, look, if I had known, I wouldn't have. At that level, any any person with a brachajit, the husband could turn around and say, it's Bekach I'm not sure that I would agree with that. And uh, So, so, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you know, two It's not like an island this, et cetera. What? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I'll give you two answers to that. One answer is, I had a case recently, a man came to me, has a daughter who has bracha, and he wants to know should he test his other daughters and it's not, they're not married. That's a very complex issue. That's why I very would say complex. that we should, we should really not really pre- test bracha in this sort of high risk until you get married, because otherwise right. we're, we're going to create a situation. The other thing right. I would say, which is very important, and that I think goes back to our question about Dori Sharim, and goes back to what we said about poor before, is that it's also a process of education. Is that if I, I have to educate people, what is the ramifications of having BRCA gene? You might say I have it, but then what does that mean? Because we're talking about, let's say we have a young woman who's now 20 years old, she's going out to get married, or she's 18, she's going to get married. And we're talking about what will happen in 20 years' time. What neither me, nor you, nor she, nor the chassan, nor anybody else knows is how we're going to treat cancer in 20 or 30 years' time. We don't know. And so it's very possible that it won't be as serious as it is today. Um, it's, it may be, but again, uh, we could all get cancer. We all have the propensity. Everybody has propensity to diseases. Um, and so it's a process of education. If someone would come to me and say, I'm going out with a girl, this is what she's got, she's got BRCA, what should I do? Then you'd have to take into account their age, what's, uh, their family history, and see how you would manage it. I would recommend them to get married younger. I would recommend them to have children younger, and then maybe they would have surgery. That's what we're suggesting today. But in 20 years, I mean, maybe it's suggesting something very, very different. So, so Rabbi Bryce, so we're, we're not a talking... process of education about mum. The idea of what's a mum and what's not a mum has definitely changed and changes the whole time. It's a dynamic. So, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Bryce, all the Rabbanim we've spoken to agree that brackets should not be tested for. It's asking for questions we don't have answers to. And yeah. there was a lot of uncertainty whether to disclose. Hello? Hello? I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, 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 the Rabbanim we've spoken to have almost universally said, uh, do not test for BRCA, single girl. And yeah. they were, I couldn't get an answer out of if it's discovered whether to disclose. What is Pua's position? I think if you know about it, I think it's hard to not say. But what I would do, and I said to a young man this week who was in my office who had a genetic abnormality, I said, you can go and get married. And before you get married, you're going to have to tell your kala what you have because it's a serious thing. But you'll bring her to my office and I'll explain her the ramifications. You'll tell her the reality that you have it. I'll explain to her what that means. And she will decide whether that she wants to go into that. And so that's what I would do. I would say to the couple, to the, woman, the young woman who's at a high risk, you might have to say, but what are the ramifications of that? I'm willing to discuss and explain. And there's actually a very nice story, Rosh Lamazama, with a girl who had, uh, who was going with a, man, with a boy who had uh, epilepsy, and, uh, and and he checked out the boy, and he said, uh, you know, you check him out. I, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to explain to you what that means and to look at this case. I to say, how can you handle that? How can you manage that? Bracker is not a death sentence. It's not a death sentence. Maybe right. cancer death sentence, but it's not a death sentence. It's not like having you have something that was clearly degenerative. But it's not the case with BRCA. So we need to educate. Right. Speaking about today is education. But I think if you have it, I think it's hard to say I didn't. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, it's something discovered I had BRCA after I got married. So that's as easily as we agree that it would be better not to test prior to getting married. Rabbi Weitzman, yeah. And how much do you charge for your calls and your services at PUA? The services at PUA, so all of the counseling is all free of charge. Um, the, um, and we think that that's a policy because I don't want the couple to think, hmm, is it worth me? Am I going to get, is it, I've already got a large expense on doing treatment. I don't want to come. It's free of charge, whatever you charge. So I'm all your all hundreds of, of thousands of calls you do for free? That's free of charge. The supervision has a very uh, subsidized rate, and if people can't pay, we're able to cover it. And in fact, in the tri-state area, it's in, in sorry, New York, it's uh, actually now free. 
and uh, educational pro programs cost uh, um, as, as per cost. It, it depends what the program is. But we try to have we have a very very small budget. We try to to take the cost away from the couples and to be able to help as many of them as possible. Uh, I could say only Mika Amcha Yisrael. We have so much sorrows, but on the other hand, look what we do for each other. <laughs> yeah, Rabbi Weitz, with Rabbi Shalom, should you give you kayak that you should continue giving eight to fifteen hundred years, fifteen hundred children a year. What I can say, be, one day you'll look up and you'll say, "As a la di a c c, me me borrow the a la as a la di a c c." Okay, thank you very so much. much. For your thank time. you very much, and Michal Lachal with your program, and I appreciate it very, very much. Call so, to thank you. Bye bye. Yeah.